All right, folks, uh, so today we're gonna wrap up our discussion on personality disorders uh, and get through the cluster C personality disorders. Uh, again, if you'll remember, these uh, disorders tend to be known as the anxious uh, and avoidant disorders. Um, and that is gonna be a piece of what they share. What you're gonna see uh, with all three of these disorders is that uh, folks that have this uh, one of these disorders or some combination of them uh, tend to experience or at least display uh, some type of anxiety that uh, goes along with, with, uh, with their disorder and their um, diagnostic criteria. So um, this is a little bit different than some of the other disorders because here's one where the disorder itself uh, really seems to be imparting some, uh, some distress on the folks who are experiencing them. So uh, with the other disorders, we really lean into the idea that uh, it's so syntonic to who they are that uh, they don't necessarily experience those disorders as um, you know, problematic. They don't necessarily experience any distress directly from the disorder. So even somebody with a borderline disorder uh, or a schizoid disorder, right? Those folks uh, are happy to be how they are, even if it gets them in trouble, even if it uh, causes problems down the line. Uh, here, what you're gonna find is that the, the disorder itself, the people experiencing the disorder, um, especially in the first case uh, with the avoidant personality, uh, is that the disorder itself is creating distress along with the fact that this is their personality. So uh, it's this strange combination of a syntonic and a dystonic um, disorder that you don't necessarily see with uh, some, of the other, some of the other axis two disorders and then uh, some of the axis one disorders as well. So uh, let's start out here with avoidant personality disorder. <clears throat> This disorder is, is strange, and for a really long time, I struggled to differentiate it from a social anxiety disorder. Um, and so what that should mean to you right away is that these folks are experiencing anxiety with regard to social situations, and in particular, uh, what they are experiencing is some sense that people are judging them, some sense that people uh, are criticizing them in their head or will openly criticize them, uh, if given the opportunity. So uh, both a social anxiety and an avoidant personality are gonna have these two things in common. And to be fair, and to, to my own confusion, they almost are the same disorder. They, they almost are, uh, with the avoidant personality really being an extreme version of it. Uh, there is a bit of a difference though, and I will get to the criteria, there is a bit of a difference, uh, and that's similar to what we saw when we were looking at, uh, for instance, uh, panic disorder and uh, when we were looking at uh, separation anxiety. Uh, that is to say, it's not just that the person gets the anxiety in that situation. So uh, for the avoidant personality, it's not just that in social situations or uh, with the threat of a social situation, uh, that person may begin to experience some anxiety, uh, but also that the person spends a lot of time ruminating on, on the fact that they have anxiety in social situations. They worry even out of a social situation, even around people uh, that they should or are, are comfortable with, uh, they will worry about the next time or they'll worry about what if this person's opinion changes of me, right? And so they never find the groove that you would expect to see with somebody with a social anxiety where, sure, they don't want to get up in front of the class and give a presentation or they don't want to go to a party where they don't know anybody. Uh, but generally, if they're just hanging out with their friends or they're hanging out with their family, right, they're going to, you know, feel pretty pretty safe if they've been working at a place for a while, uh, they're gonna feel okay generally with those people or at least uh, maybe one or two or a small group of those people, if not everyone. Uh, but the socially anxious person uh, has a really hard time getting over that hump, has a really hard time eventually getting comfortable with folks and they are gonna spend that time when they should be comfortable, should be comfortable, um, also ruminating about the fact that uh, this is how I'm gonna be at work tomorrow, I don't know, you know, somebody's gonna figure out that I'm really shy and start asking me about it, right? These types of things uh, that you wouldn't expect with a social anxiety. So uh, let's get to the diagnostic criteria. These are on page 672. 
uh, avoidant personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, and hypersensitivity to negative evaluation beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by four or more of the following. Uh, number one, and again, number one tends to be the hallmark. So, uh, avoids occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal contact because of fear of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. Uh, right, so here they really hit on that occupational activities. Um, I don't know if they mean this specifically in terms of employment, but occupational can also just mean doing things, right? O occupying some uh, situation or occupying uh, some event, right? Just going out and being um, operative. So uh, th these folks are gonna, in all of those situations where there's something to do and there's other people around, are gonna be really worried about the criticism that they may experience from others. Number two is unwilling to get involved with people unless certain of being liked. Uh, so this is gonna be one of the most distressing or at least problem causing um, criteria for folks with this disorder is that they're, they're not even gonna give people a chance uh, usually. But, and it's, you know, interestingly, it's because they think people aren't gonna give them a chance. Uh, and so what you see is that they're gonna avoid situations um, of meeting new people, of you know, interacting with neutral folks, uh, because they expect that people aren't going to like them, and so unless they have some guarantee, uh, and I'm not sure what would qualify, qualify as a guarantee for for these folks. I don't know if it's enough if somebody they really do trust says, "Hey, this person's a really nice guy. They never say anything mean about anyone. They like everyone they meet." I don't know if that's what's needed, or if. Um, you know, they need to observe the person and, and see that for themselves. And I'm sure it's different uh, for each individual person, but uh, I am curious what that guarantee uh, looks like and how much of that needs to be locked in. Uh, one thing you, you'll, you'll tend to see in the clinical uh, experience is, um, again, these disorders are really thinking about what the interaction with the therapist might be like. And so uh, you can imagine the, the tricky nature of navigating um, navigating a client or a patient who's got uh, this type of personality. Um, on the one hand, a therapist is someone who might meet that criteria, right, of someone who's certain to like me, right? They're, they're supposed to help me, they're gonna say nice things to me, they're gonna be motivating, they're gonna be inspirational, they're gonna be comforting, all, all of these things that the avoidant person wants to make sure uh, they're gonna get out of an interaction or relationship. Um, but on the other hand, the therapist might really feel boxed in by that need to make sure that uh, the client always feels liked by them. Otherwise, they might run away, right? Uh, you give the client some uh, tough feedback or you challenge the client in some way in which they're not comfortable and they read that as some threat or they don't think I'm doing good enough or they don't have any more faith in me or whatever and then they just avoid the situation. And, and this is typical of the avoidant personality is that when they feel that threat, they avoid, right? They just get out of there. Uh, they, they leave the scene never to come back. Uh, number three, shows restraint within intimate relationships because of a fear of being shamed or ridiculed. So um, this might really speak to what I was just saying about the therapeutic relationship. Uh, but obviously the criteria here is talking about uh, more personal relationships. Uh, and so these folks are going to have almost um, a paranoid uh, interaction style or a paranoid way of thinking about uh, interactions and relationships because uh, they think that the person is going to be critical of them. Again, unlike the, the paranoid personality uh, where you might expect this person to fight back or be mean first or, you know, get angry about the fact uh, that they're being criticized in, in somebody else's head. Uh, this person is again just going to shrink away. They're not going to want that confrontation. They're not going to want to stand up for themselves. They're going to say, "Okay, well, if you guys don't like me, or I think you guys don't like me, I'm just going to, you know, take off." So uh, number four is preoccupied uh, with being criticized or 
rejected in social situations. So again, this really speaks to that idea of it's not just in the moment, it's not just when they're in the social situation that they experience that anxiety, but that they're preoccupied with it, right? That even outside of the uh, so outside of a social situation, even when they're by themselves, this might be something that they're ruminating on. Uh, they are preoccupied with the fact that, oh my gosh, nobody likes me. Uh, or, or even I've seen it, uh, you know, some folks with the point in are ruminating on the fact that they think that no one likes them, right? Oh, I wish I didn't think this way. I wish I could let people in my life. Oh, I'm, you know, whatever it is, right? they're spending a lot of time ruminating on the fact that this uh, disorder, this personality style, uh, is a part of who they are. Number five, is inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of feelings of inadequacy. Uh, so going along with that sense of, uh, you know, reading into interpersonal relationships and thinking that pe people are feeling, uh, you know, feeling badly about them or judging them in some way, uh, they're also going to hold back, right? So they're going to hold back in these relationships. They're not going to let other people know very much. They're not going to let people in, so to speak, uh, because they are fearful that the more that they get to know about me, the, the more they're not going to like me or the um, more likely it is that they're going to find something that they hate and then I won't be able to uh, come, come around anymore. So um, not only will you see them ruminating about this, but with behavioral piece, uh, that you'll see is that in their relationships, they're really going to be withheld uh, in terms of their ability to, to connect, to open up uh, with others. Number six, views the self as socially inept, personally, personally unappealing, or inferior to others. So they're really going to have this uh, almost inferiority complex uh, where not only do they worry that people are going to judge them? And here's a piece that maybe is also different for the socially anxious person. Uh, with a social anxiety disorder, with a social phobia, you might expect that the person has a relatively positive view of themselves. They're just worried that other people uh, won't share that, right? Uh, I think this, this, uh, this project that I put together is really good. I'm really excited. Uh, to present what I found, but I'm really worried that other people won't like it and that they're just going to laugh at me, right? And so you can hear them holding both pieces of, I think it's pretty good, but now I'm just really worried about what other people are going to say. Uh, the avoidant personality, uh, a more typical trend of their behavior is just to say, I this really sucks. I don't want to show this to anybody. Everybody's going to laugh. They're going to think it's stupid. I think it's stupid, right? And so they're going to kind of almost be on the side uh, of the criticism. Know, this criticism in their head is coming uh, from somewhere it's, it's coming from their own head and so um, they rather than kind of fearing that criticism almost side with it and fear it yeah you're right I do suck I probably shouldn't uh, get up there and all okay so uh, number six nope that was six uh, number seven is unusually reluctant to take personal risk or to engage in any new activities because they may prove embarrassing. So in addition to holding back uh, being withheld within relationships, they are going to broadly uh, be withheld in their life. They're going to hold themselves back from a lot of things. Um, I'll probably link some YouTube videos of YouTubers describing or talking about their um, avoided personalities. Uh, one of the things you know that often comes up and one of the things that you'll tend to see with these folks is not only are they going to have a hard time uh, in relationships, uh, certainly romantic relationships, but possibly even friendships or inter other interpersonal relationships. Uh, but one place they tend to really struggle is at work, um, especially it seems, and, and this is a hump they have to get over. And um, I actually haven't seen any accounts of um, them getting over it to see kind of what that looks like on their side. But often what happens is. You know, they've been avoiding for weeks, months, years, uh, and now I need to get out and get a job. I'm going to talk myself into this. I'm going to go out. I'm going to do this. Right? They go out. They get a job. They work there for a day, maybe two days, and the anxiety of having new people around them, wondering what everybody's thinking about them, uh, eventually they may just not show up anymore, or they may call and quit and say, hey, uh, this job isn't for me, and that's it. And they may repeat that pattern. You know, weekly, they may repeat it monthly, right, depending on how much time it takes them to remuster the courage to go back out uh, and apply and then uh, show up for another job. 
uh, but often this is one of the real um, inhibitors to a satisfactory life for these folks is not only are they having a hard time in relationships, but they're probably having a really difficult time with income uh, as well and certainly any type of career that they might want to pursue because they, they just can't stick with it. They just really have a hard time uh, being around people. Um, I, I do wonder if, you know, what this looks like for, for folks who maybe work at home, if they have that same uh, sort of judgment or that same sort of fear about their um, kind of work that they're turning in or how they're performing, or if it really is uh, just designated or reserved for folks who are in person. I'm sure it's worse. Uh, much, much worse for folks in person, uh, but I haven't seen much on now that a lot of people are not just in this moment, of course, but now that uh, a lot of people just tend to work from home anyway to some degree, uh, I wonder if that's been really helpful for folks with avoidant or if this is kind of still more of the same. Uh, I still just don't want to turn things in. You might judge it poorly. Okay, uh, dependent next. All right, so the dependent personality is similar in some ways to the avoidant personality disorder. Uh, the similarity being that the dependent personality uh, disorder also gives the person that, that has it this sense of them being really inferior, the sense of them uh, not being good at things and that person having a lot of anxiety uh, about doing uh, things. Uh, there's a difference here, of course, where uh, with the avoided personality, what you get is that the person is really worried about the evaluation of others, the sense that other people uh, are going to judge them. So interpersonal uh, things become really difficult for them. Going to work again, going to school, uh, doing things where they have to interact with other people, uh, certainly in person. Um, but the dependent personality is is a little bit more concerned uh, with something else and, and maybe maybe everything else. Uh, that is to say, they don't just doubt their ability within an interpersonal context, they tend to doubt their ability about everything. They tend to think that anything that they do is going to fail or they're not going to uh, do it well enough or that somebody else could just do it better and so why should they try? Uh, and so the way that they handle this tends to be that they will find someone else uh, to, to do everything for them, to make decisions for them in their life. Uh, this is typically called uh, though this isn't necessarily official language, uh, this is typically called the co-dependent, right? The, the person that they are depending on uh, to make decisions for them is, the, is this co-dependent person. Um, dependent personality also shares some similarities with a borderline uh, personality disorder. Um, and that is to say this anxiety about the relationship itself, not necessarily judgment from the relationship, but with regard to their codependent, what do I have to do to make sure that this person doesn't leave, right? And that's almost that's the same thought that the borderline uh, personalities are having. Uh, this is more about uh, how do I keep this person around? Uh, and unlike the borderline personality, they're, they're not going to resort to um, these really drastic, these really frantic means to keep those people around. So they're not going to threaten suicide. They're not going to damage property, right? This isn't typical, right? Anything could happen. Uh, but they're not going to typically engage in these types of frantic behaviors that you see uh, with the borderline personality. Instead, uh, what they're going to tend to do is just keep trying to be nicer. Just keep trying to accommodate that person more. Oh, you don't like the shoes I'm wearing? That might make them leave. Let me go buy a new pair of shoes. And meanwhile, I'm picking those shoes out. I'm going to call you. What, what type of shoes do you think I should get? Um, the 11s are a little bit tight. Do you think I should go up or should I just deal with the Right there, every little detail about their life uh, is going to need some help from that dependent, that codependent, or at least that they're going to feel like it does. They're not going to trust uh, any of their own decision making. They're not going to trust any of their own processes. They're going to always divert that. They're always going to always uh, defer, excuse me, uh, that decision, that, that process to the codependent. Hey, what do you think I should do? And again, it will be not just big decisions, certainly big decisions, right? Buying a house, uh, buying a car, you know, which jobs to apply for, this type of thing, but also little decisions. What should I wear this morning? Um, and literally calling you on the phone in the morning and saying, hey, I, this is what I have set out. Do you think 
this is okay. Also, oh, let me just show you my closet and you pick out what I should wear. Uh, and so they're really gonna have a really, really hard time uh, making any decision for themselves. So, so uh, let's look at the diagnostic criteria uh, just to flesh that out a bit more. Uh, and we'll see what the dependent personality looks like. So uh, this is going to be on page 675 of the DSM. Uh, dependent personality disorder, a diagnostic criteria. A pervasive pattern, excuse me, a pervasive and excessive need to be taken care of that leads to submissive and clinging behavior and fears of separation beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. Number one, has difficulty making everyday decisions without an excessive amount of advice and reassurance from others, right? So just as I've been saying, they're gonna have a really hard time uh, making any decisions for themselves Number two, needs to assume, excuse me, needs others to assume responsibility for most major areas of his or her life. So uh, big financial decisions, like I'm saying, big employment decisions, probably even big family decisions are gonna go through the codependent, if at all possible. Uh, number three, has difficulty expressing disagreement with others because of a fear of loss of support or approval. So again, this is kind of that, what I'm calling kind of that borderline um, trait where they really do fear this rejection or this loss uh, of the codependent. And so again, what you'll see is they'll tend to make a lot of ends, um, make a lot of inroads in order to keep that person around, do a lot of things that they wouldn't necessarily normally do. Uh, say they like doing they didn't necessarily like or know that they really wouldn't like, uh, but it's going to please the codependent. So uh, I'm just going to say, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, number four, has difficulty initiating projects or doing things on his or her own because of a lack of self-confidence in judgment or abilities rather than a lack of motivation or energy. So they're trying to differentiate here with that last piece that it's not a motivation piece, it's not an energy piece, right? This isn't depression or ADHD. This is, you know, they have the energy and they have the motivation, but I, I just don't think I'm gonna be any good, so never mind. Uh, so they tend to just feel like doing things or even things that they uh, want to do or would prefer to do, uh, they often don't do them because they feel like they're not going to do them very well. Unless, of course, they have the support, approval, motivation uh, from the codependent. Number six, feels uncomfortable or helpless when alone because of an exaggerated fear of being unable to take care of him or herself. Uh, so even just being alone, right, and again, this is something that's, that's really going to separate them, of course, from the avoided personality is when the dependent personality is alone, what you're going to see is that they're going to feel, you know, oh gosh, who's going to tell me what to eat uh, today? Oh gosh, who's going to tell me what to wear? Who's going to tell me um, if, if this is a good show to watch on? I mean, I'm 30 minutes in, so it seems okay to me, you know, I'm going on, but it's that idea of them really having a hard time doing anything on their own without someone motivating or encouraging them or uh, approving of, of what they're doing. Okay, uh, number seven, feels, excuse me, urgently seeks another relationship as a source of care or support when a close relationship ends. So they're gonna want to always, always, always be in a relationship. This doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic relationship. Uh, it, tends to be because that's one where you can be really intimate and maybe it's a little less weird to defer decisions or get um, input from from another person right than it would be if it were just a friendship uh, or something like that so uh, these folks are really going to always be looking for that codependent if their codependent tends to be uh, somebody that they're in a romantic relationship with then you will see them uh, once a relationship ends immediately seek out uh, another relationship or be very uncomfortable, be very anxious uh, in that meantime. Um, the other thing that, that uh, you'll see with these folks, and I'm thinking about how this relates to therapy, uh, is that when this person comes into the therapeutic office, uh, sometimes the therapist is that relationship filler. And so again, thinking about how this impacts the therapeutic alliance, 
Uh, these folks are going to come in and really want the therapist to make decisions uh, for them. They're not going to feel comfortable with what tends to be, you know, the majority of therapeutic styles of just asking questions uh, and reflecting and, uh, you know, giving, you know, broad statements of, of what's going on and encouraging uh, in, a, in a broad but not specific way, they're not going to like that. Uh, they're going to ask for specifics. What should I do? I told you that I'm having trouble with this person at work. Uh, they want me to do this. I really think that's a bad idea. What do you think I should do? Well, you know, let's explore what you want to do and what would be the best option, right? <laughs> they might tolerate that, right? Again, they're not going to be pushy in the way that uh, somebody with a, a borderline or paranoid uh, personality might be, but they're going to be really uncomfortable with the fact that you're not giving them uh, direct advice and telling them what to do. Um, and so this can obviously cause some trouble in a therapeutic relationship where the therapist is there to help the person explore rather than uh, give them strict advice. Okay, number eight, last one, uh, is unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of him or herself. So again, similar uh, to the avoidant personality where it's not just the context itself uh, that, that brings up these feelings, that brings up this type of anxiety, uh, but also they spend a lot of time even outside of the situation, even when they're in a relationship with somebody that feels like a good uh, codependent for them. They're still going to spend a lot of time worrying, well, what if this person leaves or what if I can't call them and I have to figure out what we're going to eat for dinner tonight, right? All of these type of things are, are going to be something that the dependent personality uh, is ruminating on in addition to having those uh, experiences within the context uh, of those uh, dependent needing to make uh, decisions, situations. All right, uh, last up, we're gonna cover obsessive compulsive personality disorder. All right, so obsessive compulsive personality disorder is, um, I think it's a bit of a strange uh, disorder in that it's a disorder that not a lot of people know about, um, but a lot of people talk about, or at least talk about the traits of it. Uh, this is because I think there's a lot of confusion, of course, uh, between obsessive compulsive disorder uh, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Now, why they chose to name these the same thing and not go back and rename it, uh, they rename disorders all the time, uh, is, is a bit baffling to me because I think this confusion is undue and while there are, I guess, some similarities, at least uh, superficially, uh, to the two disorders, uh, they are quite different. They are, you know, in totally different sections uh, of the DSM, um, you know, housed under totally different uh, diagnostic criteria. And so um, I, I think it would be helpful if uh, this had a different name so that people don't have this confusion. Uh, what I'm talking about, of course, is, you know, when, when folks call their friends OCD uh, for being what we might otherwise call, and here's another psych term, right, anal. Um, that is to say, a person who likes things just so, a person who's really, really uh, particular about the way uh, that they do things and the way that they want things done. Um, the person with an obsessive compulsive disorder, as we've talked about, uh, this is really more of a true anxiety disorder where the obsessions and compulsions are done to relieve some type of uh, stress or anxiety or to get rid of some compulsion, excuse me, to get rid of some obsession that they're having. Uh, however, with the obsessive compulsive personality disorder, uh, you, you almost get the opposite where um, the, the person doesn't have these type of obsessions unless the thing d doesn't get done, unless something uh, isn't the, the same way. So it's, and it's not the same type of obsession either, right? It's not this uh, anxiety that is disconnected usually from, uh, from what the the thing they're doing is, right? I'm going to wash my hands a hundred times because uh, somehow that'll make me safer than washing my hands one time. Uh, no, with the obsessive compulsive personality disorder, what you find is they want things done just so, and then when it's not done just so, right, you almost might call it a com 
compulsive obsessive disorder, right? When they can't do the thing that they want to have done like they want to have it done, then they're going to have that, that cognitive piece show up where, oh man, I really don't like the way those bookcases are aligned. Yeah. Uh, that one really should be over there. Or this one's a little crooked, right? That's when you see that type of obsessive, if you want to call that, call it that rumination about a thing. And when and if they can go fix it, right? If I say, okay, we'll go straight in the bookcases, put them like you like them, right? Then they're done, right? That, that's over. They're not gonna come back to that unless uh, the bookcases misalign. Um, it's not the same thing, again, uh, as somebody who thinks they're always in danger of um, getting contaminants on their hands. So daily, hourly, you know, uh, sometimes several times an hour, they need to go back and, and wash their hands or whatever uh, their ritual is. So um, it's, it's a, bit similar and so you can see why they use those words uh, obsession and compulsion but uh, but it's really rearranged uh, in such a way that it, it really has a different um, experience certainly in terms of the psychological experience and then I think even behaviorally it's pretty easy to see the difference between the two so uh, let's look at the diagnostic criteria and then uh, maybe say a bit more about it this is on page uh, 678 of the DSM Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, efficiency, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by four or more of the following. Number one, he's preoccupied with details, rules, lists, order, organization, or schedules to the extent that the major point of the activity is lost. Uh, what you'll find with folks who have uh, an obsessive compulsive personality is uh, that they tend to really want to get things right. Uh, and what does right mean? Right often means uh, what the details are, what uh, somebody says you're supposed to do, uh, what, what your own conception of perfect means, well, they're gonna really try to get things to be perfect, even if that means uh, that the reason that you were writing this expense report was so that you could turn it in uh, to the boss and get paid for the job uh, that we did. You don't need to have it be perfect to the eighth decimal point and have the perfect font and make sure that it fits on one page. Oh no, two lines went on the second page. I got to you know, change, right? This is what an obsessive compulsive personality would do is, you know, you're just doing that to get paid and it doesn't need to look perfect. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, the best expense report ever. It just needs to get done. Uh, but what you'll find with the obsessive compulsive personality is that they still want it perfect. Uh, and often what you'll see, and this is going to come up here in this criteria pretty soon, um, is that they're more likely to even just turn that expense report in late, even if it means they'd get paid less, because they want to keep working and make sure that it gets perfect, right? The, the, the true nature of the activity, or what's the word in here? Uh, the major point of the activity gets lost, right? They're just doing this to get paid, but they have to have it perfect, and so the, that point is irrelevant until I get it the way that I want it. Number two, shows perfectionism that interferes with task completion, uh, such as is unable to complete a project because of his or her own overly strict standards. So uh, this is just what I was talking about, right? This sense of not getting things finished, not because they're procrastinating, but often because they're working really hard on it, uh, and it's just not there yet. It's, it's still not there yet. It's not as good as I wanted. It can still be better. Uh, and so again, they're going to turn things in late or they're going to miss uh, deadlines often because they feel the need to keep working on the thing uh, until it meets their standards. Number three uh, is excessively devoted to work in productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendships not accounted for by obvious economic necessity. Um, this is something I have found to be true and in, in folks that I've worked with um, that, that in some cases they will see relationships as mostly instrumental. Uh, what can this person do for me? Uh, how can I, you know, 
use this person to get ahead. And it's not quite in an antisocial or narcissistic way. They don't care about you. <laughs> you know, if, if this holds true for them, they won't care about you either way. So where the narcissist would write you off, that person's stupid, they can't see how brilliant I am. Um, or where the antisocial would um, you know, just want to use you in a way that would help them get ahead and they're fine with hurting you or whatever it takes. Uh, this person isn't going to go that far and they're also not going to have the kind of narcissistic I'm going to write them off and I'm going to feel the need to insult them and tell them how stupid they are because, you know, they're not doing what I, what I need to do. But it is almost sort of like a, a digital, you know, zero or one. Right? Do, do you have usefulness or do you not have usefulness? And if you have usefulness to me, then I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to have connections. Um, and that's going to be a piece of it, but if not, I'm not sure what you're, I'm not really sure what you're doing here. Um, this will also, uh, of course, affect their relationship. So again, not so much that they're trying to use people, but they just won't feel the need to connect with people unless it's for something. What, what are they here for? How can they help me uh, get this project done, etc. And so uh, their relationships will tend to suffer. They will uh, usually, they can sometimes treat people uh, just like work instruments. And again, not in this um, violating your human rights way, but in a that's what I need you for uh, kind of way. All right, uh, number, I think we're on number four. Yes, uh, number four is over conscientious, scrupulous, uh, and inflexible about matters of morality, ethics, or values. Uh, and so we're going to see what this person is. Again, they want things the way that they want them, and this is also going to uh, bleed into the way that they think about values and ethics, right? Is this a right thing to do? Is this a wrong thing to do? Well, if it's wrong, then you shouldn't do it, and I don't understand. And they're really going to kind of project their own uh, sense of values and ethics onto other people uh, and expect them just to follow that, right? That might be a piece of the formula of if this person is useful or, or not useful person helpful or not helpful. So they know how to follow the rules or they can do things uh, the way that I want them done or are they uh, having the same value system with regard to this project that I am. Uh, and so they're going to be, you know, not only are they going to have that sense of perfectionism uh, for themselves, this is another difference between OCD and OCPD. Not only do they have that uh, type of obsessive compulsive behavior for themselves, they also will expect those type of compulsive, excuse me, and obsessive behaviors in others. You're gonna do it as good as I would have done, uh, or else, you know, why would you need to do it? Number five, is unable to discard worn out or worthless objects, uh, even when they have no sentimental value. So here we're connecting a little bit back to the true OCD. Uh, where OCD is is connected, right? Uh, um, hoarding disorder is a type of obsessive compulsive disorder, and so here's a, a touch of that feature, right? Where they're really gonna hold on to things. I might need this later. This might be useful. Don't throw that away. Of course, they're likely to have it very well organized, uh, as different than uh, what we might expect from uh, a hoarder uh, in the access one capacity. Uh, but here, they're gonna have that same type. Uh, of behavior or things might be useful. I don't want to get rid of things uh, as well. Number six uh, is reluctant to delegate tasks or to work with others unless they submit to exactly his or her way of doing things. So again, that projecting that perfectionism uh, onto other people um, and and they're fine with doing it themselves, right? Maybe they shouldn't be just in terms of thinking about time and thinking about, you know, uh, deadlines, maybe they shouldn't be, and often this can get them in trouble. Uh, but usually, if they see that this isn't done to their specifications, move out do it. Just let me handle it, and you'll see them do this all the time. Uh, and sometimes they won't necessarily do it in a way that um, is as unflattering to the person. They might say, oh, this is really nice, thank you for uh, turning this in, and then uh, spend the next six hours editing it, almost rewriting it, because of they didn't think it was up to their standards before uh, they turned it in. So uh, you can see this show up in, in a lot of different ways, but overall what the point of this one is, is that uh, these folks are, are not going to be um, 
really confident in the skills of other people, uh, in the talents of other people, and you can imagine how this might be problematic if uh, this is a boss or somebody that you're working with on a school project, right, that they need to go back and check every little thing you know, that you do. Um, in, in addition to, you know, just taking on a lot, that can also make the person whose work you're correcting feel like, you know, I spent a lot of time on that and you just went through and, you know, made it different. And you didn't even talk to me about the fact that you didn't like X, Y, and Z, you just changed it, right? And so uh, these folks can, can also make other people feel belittled inadvertently uh, because they go back and they want to do it perfectly and their version of perfect is uh, what it is. Number seven, uh, adopts a miserly spending style toward both self and others. Uh, money is, is, excuse me, money is viewed as something to be hoarded for future catastrophe. So um, you'll see that these people tend to be, can be penny pinchers is what this is basically getting at. Miserly means, uh, you know, stingy basically. And so what they're saying here is that these folks aren't going to spend money really easily uh, on other people or even on themselves. They're going to feel like, well, I probably should uh, hold on to that just in case something terrible happens in the future. So uh, they're going to be really held back with their money. Um, and then number eight shows rigidity and stubbornness. And this just means that they tend uh, to be a pretty stubborn person. Uh, now I've described this as somebody who's maybe kind of bossy and, uh, and sometimes they certainly can be, right? They can be this type of person who's barking at other people, uh, but they can also be a little bit more reserved and, and kind of taking this perfectionism <clears throat> uh, in, a, in a more quiet, more personal way, right? Rather than telling you they don't like the job that you did, they're just going to change your work. Rather than telling you uh, they don't like where you left that class before you left, um, they'll just wait till you leave and then they'll move it, right? And so you can still have this person, you can certainly have this person who's um, even somewhat accommodating to other people, uh, though privately they may be going back and fixing things and spending a lot of time uh, trying to make things perfect. And, and again, most of that perfectionism tends to be directed uh, at the self, at their own work, right? I need to uh, make sure that I get things like this. I need to make sure that I look like this. I need to make sure that before I turn it in, these things happen. So uh, often again, that's mostly directed at the self, though it is not unusual for them to direct that at others and have other people feel that, uh, that same kind of pinch of uh, needing to be perfect uh, when they're around them or when they're working uh, for them. Okay, uh, so this all three of uh, these uh, clusters of personality disorders, uh, it does tend to take this long. I know we're kind of in a uh, strange time, of course, but uh, it does usually take this long to get through all of them. I tend to spend uh, more time each class uh, uh, on each one of them than I intend to, but again, I really like talking about them. And, and so it is a shame that we can't be together. Um, so again, that's it for these personality disorders. Next time, uh, we're gonna start talking about testing. Uh, it'll be a little bit difficult to, to, to get this in uh, via this style of, of teaching. Again, usually this is something that I have a really uh, more interactive class around, but uh, I'll try to be uh, creative and see if I can um, at least show you some of the, the stuff that I would have shown you in class and, and on the video so I can talk about it with you. Um, and uh, I do wanna look at both uh, some cognitive uh, testing some pencil and paper testing, uh, but also I want to look at a little bit at some projective testing. Uh, I won't be able to call one of you up and, and have you be a guinea pig for the class, but um, uh, hopefully you know I'll uh, do a good enough job of explaining it to you, and you can do some of the readings uh, in order to see more about how to use those. And uh, I will say that I think that will be our last uh, video before the final. So. Um, let me know if you have any questions about the final coming up. Uh, I'm still accepting uh, these personality disorder papers if you haven't turned uh, that in yet. I know some people asked for an extension or some people maybe were just waiting uh, for me to get all of these videos out. That's fine. Uh, just let me know uh, if you have any questions about uh, that paper, if you have any questions about the final, uh, and then otherwise I'll just see you next time.